Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and very excited that we're joined today by Roshi Joan Halifax. Now, before we get to her formal introduction, Banyan Books acknowledges that although we have people joining us from all over the world for these live stream events, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Most of Banyan's events and podcasts are free. We welcome your donations to help keep these programs accessible for all. Just click on the PayPal link in the show description below. Roshi Joan Halifax, our guest today. She is a Buddhist teacher, an anthropologist, and writer. She is a founding teacher in the Zen Peacemaker Order of Roshi Bernie Glassman and the late Sensei Jishu Holmes, and is a Soto priest and teacher. In 1979, she founded the Ojai Foundation, an educational center, and in 1990, Upaya, a Buddhist study center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's been on the faculties of Columbia University, the University of Miami School of Medicine, the New School for Social Research, the Naropa Institute, and the California Institute for Integral Studies. Halifax is a distinguished invited scholar of the U.S. Library of Congress and the only woman and Buddhist on the Tony Blair Foundation's Advisory Council. She has worked with dying people since 1970. In 1994, she created the project on being with dying as a way to train healthcare professionals in contemplative care of the dying. Her books include The Human Encounter with Death, with Stanislav Grof, Being with Dying, and Standing at the Edge. Today, Roshi Joan Halifax is with Banyan Books in conversation about her new contemplative card deck, In a Moment, In a Breath, 55 Meditations to Cultivate a Courageous Heart. Featuring Halifax's original artwork, In a Moment, In a Breath is a curated collection of 55 short meditations to help you tune in, cultivate compassion, and still the mind in just a moment's notice. The cards are inspired by the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. Nourishing courage, transforming grief, anchoring the mind, letting go of fear, these are some of the topics that help us to cultivate compassion, mindfulness, and calm and will benefit both seasoned meditators and beginners alike. If you'd like to learn more about today's honored guest, you can visit either upaya.org or joanhalifax.org. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Roshi Joan Halifax. Thank you, Ross. Thank you for that introduction. Actually, it's... Uh, it's several former lifetimes. I'll, I'll one day send you an updated. And uh, just to uh, let my friends know, I think I was uh, 
um, you know, very fortunate to have this time at uh, our Library of Congress to look deeply into this whole landscape of compassion. And this is what has inspired these cards. You know, uh, before I, I talk about the cards, though, I, I, I pulled a card at random. And uh, it says water, living by vow. Um, that is that, that section. And the card I chose actually means a lot to me, um, hardly because of my relationship with the Benedictine monk, Brother David Stendhal Rost, who uh, has really dedicated his life to articulating um, the vision and the depth of heart um, of gratefulness. So I picked the gratefulness card, I'm, I'm happy to say, and thinking about Brother David, who's I think 96 years old now. So I offer this as uh, just a brief meditation. Gladdening your heart with a deep inhalation and relaxed exhalation. Recite these words to yourself. May I be grateful for this life. May I be grateful for this life. May I be grateful for all those in my life. May I be grateful for all those in my life. May I be grateful for the lessons given to me. May I be grateful for the lessons given to me. May I be grateful that I have the heart to serve. May I be grateful that I have the heart to serve. So this is just one of the, the 55 um, practices. And as uh, you said, Ross, um, I used uh, the four elements in space as the kind of uh, frame of reference for uh, each of these uh, sets of practices. So it was really... It was a beautiful process uh, for me to um, uh, put together this wonderful deck. I, I love it. <laughs> um, me too. Yeah. And I, I understand you did that for each element. There's a beautiful painting on the back of each one of those cards that you did. And I, I understand you did that during 2020 and 21 during the pandemic times. What was that process like for you? Well, you know, um, I live in this beautiful practice center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, we uh, have a very robust practice and uh, training programs. And then the pandemic hit and we had to close and uh, we went online, but um, uh it's been, you know, quite uh, an interesting three years in, you know, a completely different mode. When we're online now, I think this is, you know, part of the gift of the pandemic is that um, we at Upaya uh, fostered an, an international community um, of thousands of people who uh, joined us for 
meditation and um, for trainings and practice periods and so forth. Um, we also uh, cook for the unsheltered and we teach in the prison system and in recovery centers. And it was a, it was a real uh, shift for us to suddenly be in lockdown. And because I'm elderly, uh, I'll be 81 in a few weeks, um, uh, I went up to my hermitage in the mountains uh, that um, have been, if you will, my protector for uh, many decades. And uh, I lived in relative isolation for a good part of the pandemic, of course, being online quite a bit. And um, during that period, uh, among many other things that I did was I took up uh, painting every single day. Um, I would paint Enso's or Zen circles or mountains or uh, fire and, you know, paint the elements because I was up at 9,400 feet in a very uh, small uh, hermitage um, in a very raw circumstance, even without plumbing. And, um, you know, I sat a lot. I did a lot of Zazen. I taught a lot uh, online, um, but also I painted a lot. And um, uh, during that period, um, I interacted with uh, many, many people. And uh, in the course of these encounters, you know, uh, one of the things that I became so aware of was um, people wanted to be able to state shift, to drop into uh, a state of meditation in a very short period of time. And partly, you know, people were so involved with online, this, that, and the other thing. In a way, it's kind of, people were kind of exhausted and they needed an exhale. And I began to um, craft these practices, these micro practices like micro dosing meditation, very inspired by my beloved friend, uh, Sharon Salzberg, Thich Nhat Hanh, Glassman Roshi, and others uh, uh, in, in their work, inspired by my Tibetan teachers and um, uh, just really wanting to create the, a system or a way for people to uh, drop in in a moment in a breath. And, you know, I'm used to leading long meditation practices, you know, up to an hour long. And I, I realize that people, many people just don't have the constitution to do that. And that um, the practices that were welling up in me is, again, inspired by my uh, beloved friends and teachers who are also uh, meditation practitioners. And I, I really have to cite Sharon Salzberg here, mostly. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I did not, uh, was not brought up in the Zen world uh, in a world of guided meditation, but it was in the early 70s I, I met Sharon. She introduced me to that process. I was dubious but then I began to do more and more public teaching and um, uh, with people who had no meditation experience who really needed um, the support of someone bringing them along. And so it became a thing. I, I saw the benefit. But instead of the long practices that um, I was accustomed to after you know, learning from Sharon, um, I created uh, these micro practices really in relation to um, what I was learning from people all over the world who wanted to be able to just drop in for a moment. So that's, that's how this came about. And one of the interesting things, Ross, is that, you know, the paintings uh, are you know, typical, this is, you know, a, an Enso that I, I did up in my cabin. And uh, there's another Enso uh, for space, and then there's a dragon for air, and then fire, a fiery blossom. 
peony and water and so forth. Um, but these paintings also are in a moment, in a breath. So they capture, you know, the, the spirit and process that um, is uh, at the heart of um, this collection. You mentioned uh, Sharon Salzberg, you mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh, and I, I wondered if we could take a look at the card which is adapted from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, and I'll show everybody, this is uh, earth, and the category is grounding. And then on this side, you can see there's the practice given, present moment, only moment. First, maybe, can you just tell us a little yeah. bit about your relationship with Thich Nhat Hanh as a, as a teacher, as a human being? Yeah, I met Ty in the mid-1960s when I was in New York. And it wasn't an a intimate meeting at all. It was an inspirational meeting. That is, he was this young Vietnamese man who'd come to our country to ask us to stop bombing his country. And I was very uh, engaged uh, in the civil rights and the anti-war movement. And I realized from Thich Nhat Hanh that one could be uh, a social activist and a contemplative at the same time. And this was uh, kind of mind blowing for me <laughs> um, because I had a kind of natural tendency toward the contemplative, but um, also my own sense of justice had been challenged by what was transpiring in my country uh, in terms of race and also in terms of um, our constant pursuit of war, which continues, by the way. And um, as a result of that, I turned toward Buddhism. And um, as a result of turning toward Buddhism, which I found to be imminently practical, you know, it wasn't a mystical pursuit that uh, um, uh, magnetized me. It made sense to me. Uh, as a young person, as a woman, uh, as a person who, of course, you know, is uh, uh, privileged um, and who also was not unaware of various uh, ways that um, uh, touched my life where suffering was very present. So it was uh, 20 years later, I became his formal student. And um, uh, one time in Plum Village, he shared uh, a version of this meditation. And I had a little cross swords with him um, because uh, the practice, as he shared it, um, it you know, was in on your in-breath, out on your exhale, in, out, then deep on the next inhale, slow on the exhale, calm on the inhale, ease. On the exhale, smile, which is very much Thai, release, and then present moment, and then um, wonderful moment. And I said to him, you know, um, I work with dying people, people dying of AIDS. Uh, I work in the prison system. Not all moments are wonderful. So I kind of objected to the last phrase in on the practice. And, uh, you know, he just smiled. Um, but I never have been able to say wonderful moment only because, yes, all moments are a blessing and wonderful, but they're not all experienced that way. So I then just uh, made the shites, uh, a slight shift to say, you know, uh, present moment, only moment. This is the only moment. And um, really pointing toward the truth of impermanence. So, uh, you know, I, I credit Ty with that beautiful meditation. And, um, but also uh, for, you know, I had to make that change in it. In, out, deep, slow, calm, ease smile, release, present moment, only moment. If 
I can rewind a little bit in your life path to your mother, I saw on your Instagram feed, there was a photo of your mother holding a small child. Maybe that was you. It was. Yes. It was such a beautiful tribute to her, but also there was some heartbreak in what you were saying. And it seemed about the life that she may have lived had it been a different era. You wrote, I have tried to live the life she longed for. And you also wrote that her words to your sister and you were, you can do anything. I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about your mother and your upbringing. Yeah, my, my mother was a, a quite beautiful woman and, um, and it was interesting. She um, uh, married my father when she was quite young and then uh, he went off to war um, and while uh, he was um, in in the Navy. She was, you know, taking care of me. And then later, when he came back and my sister arrived, you know, she was a, she was a mom and a wonderful mother. Um, in her early forties, she decided to uh, move forward with her education, and so she uh, did that. She went to the University of Miami. We lived in Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, she became Phi Beta Kappa, and she was brilliant. She, you know, she had perfect marks, perfect grades, and it's it's just interesting. Um, uh, she she could have been, you know, she could have had my life. Uh, she was so intelligent, um, but it was an era that she was caught in, and uh, it, it kind of eroded her enthusiasm for life. It's not that being a mother is, you know, bad, but she had a lot going for her and um, she never had the situation, the causes and conditions to exercise her brilliance uh, in, a, in the way of, uh, uh, that I think she really wanted to. You know, on the other hand, um, she was a volunteer her whole life. And when I was a child, she made braille books, um, she worked in the uh, military hospital a as a volunteer in the last day of her life before she died. She was a volunteer <laughs> delivering uh, books and magazines to people who were gravely ill. And she died that night. In her whole life, she, you know, she was really in disservice. And I think that is just, you know, it, it really, ins her life inspired me. Uh, needless to say, in my choices, but I had more choices socially and psychologically that I could uh, make than she felt she could make. And her disappointment um, was not inconsequential. I, you know, I think uh, she felt um, un unmet and kind of unfulfilled. The, the next element in our, in our journey with these cards is water and the categories living by vow. I, I, I'm wondering in your definition and in the Buddhist tradition, what does it mean? What does it actually mean to live by vow? Well, when the Buddha, you know, sort of shared his views with um, uh, early practitioners, um, what was very important uh, in his teachings was the relevance of the precepts. And so in the Eightfold Path, um, the precepts are, in a way, the pivot of the Eightfold Path of the Four Noble Truths, the first teaching of the Buddha. And um, what is so uh, powerful is to understand that when one lives by vow, uh, one's experience of practice deepens because your mind and field are not disturbed by non-virtue, by mischief, if you will, by harming others, um, by guilt, by shame, and so forth. And so the vows really deepen your capacity for practice. And out of that kind of deep practice, then your experience of what uh, how you're able to perceive reality, permanence, impermanence, um, uh, self, no self, um, awakening, uh, delusion, 
you know, you see things more clearly from a very stable, unperturbed base. So living by vow is really uh, at the heart of um, Buddhist practice. And it's part of what is called the threefold training. Sila, which are the precepts or the vows, samadhi, which are practice or non-dual experience, and uh, prajna, wisdom. And of course, the wiser you get, the less you want to mess around, <laughs> you know, the less you want to harm. And there's another set of vows that came later in Buddhism, but which are, of course, it, uh, part of uh, the early Buddhist teachings. And those are the vows of the bodhisattva, bodhisattvas. And um, our, our rendering of those vows are, creations are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to transform them. Reality is boundless, I vow to perceive it. And the awakened way is unsurpassable, I vow to embody it. So, you know, it's that feeling um, of non-separateness and also the potential within all of us to, to awaken from those uh, claws of the ego, of the small self that separate us from our inherent kindness and compassion. One of the cards in that section, Living by Vow, is bearing witness. And here you point us to recall our intention to be of true benefit to others. And you guide us through a, a series of steps in our practice where we're looking at bearing witness to other. And I'm just going to quote something here. You say, um, imagine sitting across from a person who is struggling or joyful. Bearing witness, do not separate yourself from whatever they are experiencing. Without judging or evaluating, become the situation itself. You are not this person, but you're also not separate from this person. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the cultivation in our day-to-day -day lives of this experience of interbeing. Yeah, thank you. That's such a wonderful question. You know, empathy and compassion are two uh, experiences that are really important for the well-being of us as individuals and of our society and of our earth. Truly. And um, when Glassman Roshi, when Bernie talked about bearing witness, it wasn't about being an, a bystander. It was really about um, non-dual practice, oneness, uh, one body practice, which is the sort of uh, richest experience of empathy that we can uh, touch into. And yet what we have to understand, you know, in this experience of bearing witness, we are not separate from any being or thing. At the same time, um, we have our individuality. And um, I know this from uh, sitting with dying people and in, in working in the prison system and working in the Himalayas in these high altitude clinics. Um, your capacity to expand your subjectivity to include the experience of another or of others or of a tree that's being cut down or a river that's polluted or a forest that's burning. Your capacity to not exclude that from uh, your subjectivity, but to expand your subjectivity into interbeing, what Ty calls uh, interbeing, is so important, but at the same time, if we don't make that distinction simultaneously between self and other, um, we go into overwhelm or what is called empathic distress. So that's one of the little pieces, you know, in that meditation that I think is quite important. Uh, but you know, I don't, I don't write about. I write about it in my book, Standing at the Edge. Um, but of course, the meditation stands just, you know, directly as as it is. And hopefully you'll discover um, that way to expand your subjectivity, to be in empathy, to uh, experience interbeing, non-separateness, one body, non-duality, 
by the and at the same time to understand that you're unique. You're also, you know, that tree is burning. You feel that burning, but you're not that tree. That person is, is dying uh, in intractable pain. You're in resonance with that person, but you're also not that person. It's really a, a perfect lead in to talk about the grace process that you developed. Um, and there's a card for that as well, cultivating compassion. And there's this process that you call grace. And this is in the section or the category in the cards, meeting the boundless heart. You talked about this empathic experience, this unity experience, but also we're unique or individual. How do we can you walk us a little bit through the yeah. grace process and how we actually protect our sensitive hearts if we're over empathizing or taking yeah. on others' pain too much? So, um, you know, I developed um, uh, this approach uh, really initially for people working uh, in medicine. And then, you know, um, uh, I'd be teaching in Japan or Europe or Canada or uh, the United States and doctors, lawyers, human rights activists, parents, educators, people said that that approach is so helpful in what I do. It's not just for people in medicine, you know, it's as a parent, you know, as a spouse and so forth. So I had created um, uh, at, at the Library of Congress, I I'd had the opportunity to develop a heuristic map of compassion that was based on Buddhist insights, but really based on social psychology and on neuroscience. And as a result of that, you know, once that uh, piece of research um, was done, um, I realized that I had to actually make uh, or create a tool um, from that research that could uh, would actualize, that could be, you know, useful to people because I saw clearly within medicine and many other areas of our life and our society, there was a profound deficit of compassion. And so as a result of that, I had this kind of moment where I thought, well, look, uh, this, this works, this is completely logical and I'll, I'll share it with you. So the mnemonic is grace and the G stands for gathering your attention. And this is a way for us to get grounded. Just take a moment, take an in-breath, exhale, notice the connection of your feet on the floor, sits bones on the cushion. Take this, just a pulse to get grounded. Then the R of grace is recall your intention. And it, you know, so often people, for example, going into medicine, have really pure aspirations, but they find themselves just sort of overwhelmed with demands and they lose uh, their the sense of purpose, of meaning in their work. Also of this unselfishness of, you know, being a doctor, presencing or a nurse, social worker, presencing intense human suffering. And, you know, at a certain point you can become numb and really the system is pushing you. There's a quota, you know, in your hospital system, you have to see so many people, the medical record situation, uh, you're asked to do things which uh, feel morally compromising to you and you lose the, the reason why you went into medicine or into law or became a teacher or a parent. So it's just a pulse recalling your intention so that's the R of grace. Then the A of grace is attuning first to yourself. You know, so often we're attuning to others, we're paying attention to others, but we have not really uh, gotten ourselves grounded, our intention lined up, but we are somatically out of touch, physically out of touch with um, maybe sensations of anxiety or, or aversion or anger or uh, so forth. So it's like being, just take a moment, touch into what your experience is in the body, what feelings are present, and also your view, how you're seeing things. So that's the first attunement, attunement to your own experience. 
is very counterintuitive compared to what is usually done by clinicians or teachers or so on. But the body beginning there holds so much information. And also our emotions, which really arise from the ground of the body and also our past experience create biases which um, can make it impossible or difficult for us to have a clean, uh, congruent relationship with the person with whom we're interacting and our views, of course. So, you know, part of this is to become aware of um, our own internal biases and to adjust ourselves um, so we can uh, be more grounded and open to what is being born witness to by us. And then attuning to others, you know, this is this experience of empathy, of really allowing ourselves to be in resonance with the, the physical presence of the individual whom we're presencing, the emotional experience, and also the cognitive, what, being able to, you know, um, uh, do perspective taking to see how this person sees their situation um, to the degree that is possible. And of course, we're all mixed up in that, you know, uh, a perfect uh, sort of perception is not possible, but being in resonance with, and from this foundation, the sea of grace, which is to consider what will really serve. So, you know, you're grounded, you're there to serve. You're attuned to yourself, you're in resonance with the other. And then dropping beneath the sort of impulsive uh, aspects of, you know, helping and um, really asking or inquiring into what will really serve. Often going into not knowing. And then the uh, E of grace is engaging, you know, which is really uh, allowing ourselves to if we're able to, to take action. Um, and uh, the second part of the E of Grace is ending. How do we complete the interaction in a way that is honest and uh, also where there's, maybe you have to ask forgiveness or you want to express appreciation or whether you acknowledge to yourself, um, I did the best I could. And it was a very tough uh, situation, but I, I, I did the best I could. So that, that is, you know, very short uh, explanation of the, the, the grace process. And it's, uh, there's even a national grace association in Japan and there are grace study groups all over Japan. And it's used in many medical centers and educators have found it very useful. And um, I, of course I included it, you know, in the deck because uh, again, in a moment, in a breath, um, you know, in the training, we go very deep into each ele element. But when you're uh, interacting with someone who is suffering I intensively, um, you know, it's, you have instantiated um, this process, which is, as, as I said, very logical. And it happens in a moment and in a breath. That's one card that I'm going to keep out as a reminder regularly. You've worked with dying people. You've you've trained. You continue to train people who work with the dying, and you've written extensively on the subject. Of course, I'm just curious to know what what was your first experience with death and dying? What was it about this part of life that pulled you towards that work? You know, I think as a child, uh, my first experience was when my uh, little dog was poisoned by a neighbor. And I was just blown away. You know, it was like, I mean, I, I uh, um, you know, I experienced such genuine grief as a little girl. Um, and that was really important to uh, go through. My parents didn't protect me from it. Uh, they didn't hide the fact that my dog had been killed. And, um, uh, you know, we have a very undefended relationship with our creatures. And, uh, you know, that's what I had as a kid. So that was the first thing. And I learned because I'd been very sick as a child. 
um, you know, how uh, somehow I had the guts to stay in the charnel ground of whatever I was in, you know, whether it was grief or grave sickness, pain, and so forth. And, and it continues that, you know, here I am in my 80s and I'm still working that equation. But then the next uh, huge loss of my life uh, was when my grandmother died and she and I were very close. And um, uh, she died a really agonizing death. This is, oh my. And I made a vow when I saw her in her coffin uh, to do whatever I could to really address the ills in the culture of medicine. So that brought me to this work of being with dying for now over 50 years. And it continues to be um, uh, a ground where I uh, continue to learn in a, a really um, hum humbling way. <laughs> you know, uh, often I, I make it sort of joke, I, I kid uh, around a lot. And, you know, I just say, well, you know, what if I blow it? You know, I, I saw my grandmother's agony. I come alongside people who really were afraid of death. And uh, I thought, wow, I, you know, anybody can lose it, you know, in the dying process. And so my own work of coming alongside dying people has been, you know, a, a, a unceasing education. One of the cards in the uh, air category, which is on being with dying, is the nine contemplations. Yeah. Yeah. And and the one that jumped out at me, I, I wanted to ask you about it. Um, the, it says, uh, I'm just finding it here. Yeah. I'm at just the time of it. death. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. It says at the time of death, material resources are of no use. Now that seems obvious almost, but I think most of us understand it intellectually, but most of us don't necessarily understand what will be of use at the time of death. Right. So I'm wondering from, from all your years of practice and being alongside people that are dying, what do you feel is of most use at the time of death? You know, I think that I spent so many years of my life doing uh, practice and engaged in service because I think that's what will be of use. You know, uh, uh, maybe I'm not the best practitioner and maybe I'm not the most compassionate person in the world, um, but I, I am really clear that uh, compassion has been a cure for me, not just uh, uh, serving others, but it's uh, brought a, a lot of depth into my life. And um, uh, that also practice itself, having an ongoing meditation practice, consistent, but also, you know, why I love these cards so much is that um, there are different ways of working with the body, heart, and mind. And um, the cards, in a way, uh, represent or uh, are an example of a, a journey that I've taken with my life since I've done all the practices uh, in this deck and learned from them all and wanted to include all of them. Uh, not that uh, one you know just rushes through the deck, but it's more that each of these practices has been a kind of a opening of a door for me. Uh, that I feel um, might serve others. And it is a wonderful deck indeed, really beautiful. And I mean, just going through it briefly to prepare for this, I saw the depth and time that, uh, that I could spend with it over, over years. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, we've got some nice questions coming in from the live audience. Uh, is it okay if we attend yeah, to some of those? Totally. Okay, and everybody uh, who didn't know, go ahead and type type any questions you have into the comments field on YouTube and we'll get to a few of those right now. So there's a question from Sabina who says, can you please discuss grief and despair? 
not around death, but regarding loved ones still living. Wow, that's a very interesting question. I, you know, I would need a uh, little more from that question to say anything, to reflect anything, uh, because one wants to be careful. You know, uh, grief. Yeah, we have to be very careful. Um, I have to be very careful in responding to such a question because obviously it's coming from your experience. And uh, I don't know enough to give you a, a response that I could feel responsible about. Well, that's okay. We can, we can go to the next question. And Sabina, if you are able to share a bit more, then we can circle back around to that one. Um, there's a question here from Craig who shares a quote from Jung, Jung that leads to a question. It's The quote is, enlightenment isn't about imaging figures of light, but about making the darkness conscious. So then Craig asks, can you speak to bringing light to the overwhelming darkness and dysfunction of contemporary culture? You know, I... I have such appreciation for that question because um, we are really uh, in a, a critical time and we can be uh, uh, lost in uh, the challenges of our time. Uh, we can experience despair, futility, um, anger. Uh, we can be numb, uh, just sh completely shut down. But I am saying to my friends, uh, like Jane Fonda and others, you know, I feel we were born for this time. You know, it's a time uh, where uh, we have the opportunity to engage responsibly and um, with a lot of love and determination in transforming the views in um, our uh, capitalistic society that have uh, just wrecked our beautiful planet. And it takes a lot of inner work and it takes a lot of community work in order to do this. And so I just say, you know, do not turn away from the darkness. That is where the assignment is. And um, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, bypassing into the light. It's a matter of uh, deep engagement with the truth of suffering and to know there is a path out of suffering. And it might not be fulfilled in our lifetime, but we will contribute by, uh, you know, working on our own situation in our communities and also globally on shifting out of the systems that um, we have bought into and become enslaved and harmed by. I hope that's okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I understand that the, the documentary film that you were part of, Into the Heart of the Mountain, just came out recently. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because I think it touches on what we're talking about here. Well, it's, it's a gorgeous film. Uh, it was done uh, 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 right before the pandemic uh, in Humla, Nepal, where we uh, offer uh, high altitude uh, clinics at high altitude for people's nomads and for people who live in these very remote areas who have no access to medical care whatsoever. And um, uh, I, I don't know how this uh, filmmaker, Anekhre Bosman, did it. I mean, we were up at altitudes more than 18,000 feet um, uh, in rain, in snow, storms, um, working with, uh, um, in our clinics, hundreds of people uh, thronging us, you know, seeking medical care. And it is um, a real triumph of the human spirit um, that she is portraying, in, not just on the side of uh, the clinic people, but also, you know, as, as Jane Fonda, who saw the film, she said, you know, she's never uh, seen people with so little, um, you know, just uh, materially, just, you know, on the edge of uh, life, but who have the kind of uh, wherewithal to um, uh, survive and to even, you know, uh, be generative through it. 
So it's an extra, I mean, visually, and the sound is amazing, but it's also a pilgrimage. It's a really powerful film. I think it's going to be going around now to festivals before it's commercially uh, released. But I just, I just totally encourage people to see it. You know, you'll see, I don't have hair in it. This is my uh, COVID hair. My hair grew out up in my hermitage because there's no plumbing up there. And so it's you know, difficult to shave my head in the altitudes. Uh, so I have a hair don't in, in the film. And now I've got uh, long hair and I'm just, just, just as easy. Um, but uh, you'll also see I look really tired because it's tough. This is, you know, the work that we have done, which I began in uh, 1980 is, you know, it's just pure grit uh, work, tough as hell, you know, in the most uh, trying conditions. But it's made me, um, you know, a more robust person for it. And the film is beautiful. I can't wait for everybody to see it. I love that term. You had a hair don't. Yeah. Um, we've Sabina has has filled us in with a little more information on her question. So the original question was, can you please discuss grief and despair, not around death, but regarding loved ones still living? And then she's added, when you cannot control the choices that loved ones make that you know are destructive to them, how can you ease your own despair and grief? Mm. Gosh, I just had a, a meeting with one of my students this morning, kind of asking the same question. And it is really difficult um, to be in that situation where uh, you, you know, in the, in the world of medicines, you know, it's called a moral dilemma. You see, or, uh, um, you know, you see a way through, you see, like if, you, if your family member is, you know, uh, uh, an alcoholic or uh, abusive, and you you know you see the harm, and you realize you can't do anything about it, and you really can't. You know, I mean, you can't make choices for others. You can do an intervention, but the person might respond or not to an intervention. And so, what is really critical um, is to face you know your own response of helplessness and of despair and to work it and to say, what am I learning here? What am I learning here from this? And to show up without judgment um, to uh, your family members or whatever the situation is, um, uh, to uh, not uh, put your plan on other people, um, but to, to bear witness and to really uh, practice loving kindness and, you know, I remember when Thich Nhat Hanh came to the United States one time, uh, right after Rodney King was uh, horribly beaten by the police in Los Angeles. And, you know, he said he didn't want to even be in our country. I could totally understand what he was saying. It was just horrifying, you know, for those of us in that era to see that video and Ty saying, you know, he didn't want to come to America. And I felt just despair when I saw the, the video of King's uh, uh, horrible beating. Could understand Ty's words, but Ty's, you know, in his please call me by my true names, you know, he, not only the little girl on the little boat out there in the boat people world, um, but the sea pirate, that also is suffering. And so it's to recognize the suffering of not only your own despair, but to the, that what has driven your family member or who, your friend or whatever uh, into this uh, state, that's suffering too. And let compassion be present, not sappy compassion. You know, that's not real compassion, but to see clearly the roots of suffering and to see if you can hold your arms open to whatever this person is going through like a grandmother would a grandchild. Roshi, there's a, there's a quote from your website that I would love to share. And it was so beautiful. And I, and I, I have a question about it. It said, as Buddhists, we, sh we share a common aspiration to awaken from our own confusion, from greed and from anger in order to free others from suffering. The Bodhisattva vows at the heart of, Ma of the Mahayana tradition 
are, if nothing else, a powerful expression of what I have called wise hope mm. and against all odds. This kind of hope is a species of hope that is victorious over fear and time. I love that. And I wonder if you can tell us more about wise hope. Well, I, I want to acknowledge um, my friend, Rebecca Solnit, uh, who's a fantastic writer and a, a very close friend of mine. Um, she has been um, uh, really delving deeply into this experience of hope, you know, kind of hope against all odds. And I actually, you know, it's a Buddhist hope and fear, um, you know, it's kind of a nemesis. Uh, you know, you, it's just not, but I was asked to give a talk at Sojiji Monastery in, in Japan on hope. And I thought, oh, great. So I, I you know, I read Rebecca's uh, book, Hope in the Dark. I talked to her extensively. I thought about hope from the Buddhist perspective, not the conventional Buddhist perspective. And I began to write about it a lot. So, you know, there's a lot about hope in, in uh, Upaya's blog. And it, it's just, as you said, um, you know, hope is, you cannot operate, and I call it wise hope. You know, conventional hope, there's always some kind of like program in the background. Uh, like there's an expectation, I want this, or I want this, that outcome. But that's not how it works, wise hope works. You cannot have uh, an idea of an outcome. It's like just doing your very best, showing up, knowing the truth of impermanence. Um, what Vaclav Havel was, uh, when he spoke about hope, he spoke, you know, you, uh, you do what is uh, aligned with your deepest values, no matter what the outcome is or the circumstances are. So, you know, uh, wise hope is, is a kind of partner to Joanna Macy's active hope. And that is hope that's, you know, actualized, brought in, into action. And um, it's partnered with uh, Solnit's uh, hope, um, you know, where in the midst of, I mean, I just look at uh, Ukraine and Zelensky, oh my Buddha, this country being overwhelmed in this uh, horrendous war. And, you know, you just stay the course, you go deep. And I'm, you know, I tell you, I'm against the war and my country is sending now cluster bombs to Ukraine and I'm just sickened by that. Um, so, you know, that's a whole other subject. But nonetheless, uh, my, my hope is, you know, is to show up and to work not only for, for peace, but for the end of uh, environmental destruction to the greatest extent that I can. As, you know, an 81-year-old woman, you just keep doing it. I have hope. It, hope is my generator. That's so wonderful. And uh, I think I probably count myself among many to be grateful for the life of work and service that you've done and continue with. And I, I want to thank also our live audience. We're grateful for your presence and for your questions and for being a part of this Banyan community. Um, I have one more question for you, Roshi. Uh, I just want to remind everyone we've been speaking to Joan Halifax, Roshi, about her uh, new card set in a moment, in a breath. 55 Meditations to Cultivate a Courageous Heart. Of course, you can get it online at banyan.com or come visit us in Kitsilano if you're in the Vancouver area. Roshi, there's a, another quote that I got from the Upaya uh, Zen Center, your center's uh, website. And um, it said, a tree has roots, a trunk, a crown, but that is not all. A tree is the very earth it is planted in. For Upaya, that is the American Southwest, its trunk upholds vows and commitments that make our center strong. The, the crown of the tree gives shelter to many. This, I hope, is how Upaya will live into the future, strongly rooted in this very earth with vows in its heart, giving refuge to all. Aww. Can you thank tell you. us more? Th yeah, thank you. And can you tell us more about the legacy you and your community have created with Upaya and, and your hope for the future uh, for this place of work and practice? You know, I think we're one of those places that brings together, as uh, Ty and Bernie did, the contemplative and social action, environmental action and responsibility. I think it's a really powerful model. And it's also one that is replicable in, you know, in various ways. So my hope for the future really is, 
you know, it's, of course, I've worked for decades in, you know, creating this place and nurturing it. And now I'm an elder in it and love it so much. Um, my hope really is that the model that um, has uh, evolved over the years here will be found to be useful um, um, in, for, for others. That, that's my deepest hope. Thank you so much. Just wonderful. I'm going to go to the mountains now. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you so much and a blessed time in the mountains. Thank you. Have a, a wonderful uh, rest of your day. You've been wonderful uh, interacting. And thank you for your questions, friends. And I hope to see you all here one day. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.